Welcome to Out of Home Insider. Today's guest is Greg Glende. Greg is the CEO of Lightbox, formerly AdSpace, a programmatic network that focuses on in-market consumers at the point of purchase or close to it in more than 300 premier shopping destinations all across the country. They don't just put screens up where people are though. Lightbox dominates the space with over 94% of all the in-mall inventory and uniquely uses video to engage buyers with brands. Their team is comprised of the best and brightest from out of home, business and technology. And today we'll spend time with the man responsible for their march to victory. Greg, thanks for being here. Thank you, thanks for having me. That's a great intro. You, you actually just passed our sales training final exam. So that was pretty good. We could have you selling stuff. Uh, oh, it's, a, it's always a tryout, right? It's a, we're always trying out for something. <laughs> That's Greg, great. you, you have, me. right? Like, and, and like, my, like most people, and, and this is where we like to start each episode is no one really has a linear path to out of home. Yeah. And yours certainly wasn't that you weren't born and raised as a billboard guy. But tell us about where you came from and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it, that's a great question. Um, so it's fine. I spent almost 20 years in radio, music, entertainment. Um, I, I was at what? Well, what's now iHeartMedia. Uh, originally, we were called Clear Channel Entertainment, and that's where I started in the mid-90s. We had a, a sister company, uh, Clear Channel Outdoor, that's still Clear Channel Outdoor, and uh, uh, funny enough, now I'm in the same building. I'm on the third floor there on the second floor, but, um, you know, so I worked with those guys, you know, kind of arm's distance. We would do some big pitches together, um, and I remember being really jealous of their business, and, you know, I thought our side was fun. The grass is always greener, you know, we had musicians and, you know, we're bringing Rihanna to meetings and things like that. And there's all these kind of interesting things on the radio side, but the stuff we were selling to advertisers was fleeting, right? It's, it's the commercials are, they air and then they're gone. And I remember the first year I went to Cannes and everybody's looking at these beautiful billboards that Clear Channel has, and they're winning awards for the art and the creative that's up there. And it's very, it was so tangible uh, that I, I always thought about that. And I think, you know, everybody in radio is jealous of the visual mediums, right? And TV and outdoor. So that was always in the back of my head. Um, you know, I went into uh, an ad network called Undertone, deep end of the pool, digital cross screen, like real, you know, digital data stuff. That company was acquired and I kind of went halfway back to music and I went to a company called Shazam that was the, the, uh, <laughs> the music identification app and ran the global, the global business there. And that was a blast, but also, again, nothing tangible. We had this very complicated product and advertisers trying to understand it and how the data worked. And Shazam went through probably the longest acquisition in history. It took us a year uh, to finally close uh, and be acquired by Apple. Um, I'm 25 years as an advertising guy. Apple kind of uh, made their reputation on no advertising, no data, consumer privacy. So uh, when that transaction happened, I had a long time to kind of, you know, walk on the beach and think about what I was going to do next. And this, I literally, the day after I made a list of what was important to me, um, somebody called and said, hey, there's a company, it's called AdSpace. Um, it's fundamentally sound. They've got a great network. Um, but I think they just have maybe some things that need to be adjusted on the marketing side and perhaps the team building and that kind of thing, the stuff that I really enjoy. And I started meeting the board, I started meeting the senior executives, and I fell in love with the company. You know, I, I looked under the hood, I got to really see everything, and I said, wow, if we just, if we tweak a few things, I think this is fundamentally an awesome company with, um, you know, famous last words, an easy path to growth. Um, you know, I probably said, as long as there's not a global pandemic, we should grow for the next four years. Um, so that was right around now, so around June of 2018, I started, uh, it was called ad space from all networks at the time. And, you know, we had the, the network was awesome. 5,000 screens, big, beautiful video with sound, all of these unique propositions, tons of scale, 80 million people a month. Um, and then all the mobile data that was coming into the space. So I really thought technology is really helping this industry. There's tailwinds in out of home and there's even stronger tailwinds in digital out of home. So it's not that I thought it was going to be easy, but I thought I, I thought I could see the playbook in my head. So so that's what we did, and I, I found myself in, uh, in out of home after all these years. I, I get to sell something beautiful with screens and sound and video, and um, you know, so far, so good. If you, if you take out from about 
March 15th to now. Other than that, it's been an awesome run and, and, and probably the best time I've had in my work life. So. And, and it sounds like things are coming back. We were just talking about it before we, we press the record button. What, what's, what's the recovery looking like? Yeah, you know, um, we closed the, my last business trip was the week of, you know, I came back to New York on March 6th. I was in Chicago. Things were starting to get pretty weird. Um, uh, my wife called, the airline called, and I don't usually talk to my wife on business trips. We're, you know, it's, we've been married a long time. It's like, just go and I'll see you when you come back. And she said, hey, have you checked the flights? The airports are, just, things started getting weird. And then we wound up shutting our office down. We're right on Park Avenue in New York. We shut it down on Friday the 13th of March. And um, we made a, a good decision at the time, and our team is awesome. And, and they said, hey, if, if our audience is gonna disappear and these malls are gonna close and we're gonna turn off 5,000 screens, um, we should probably be measuring this, which sounds crazy, but this way, when things start to open up, we'll have a really authentic, trustworthy set of baseline numbers where we can show our growth. So um, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. The team was really smart. Um, we interviewed a bunch of companies. We wound up hiring Intermix, who has credibility, and um, and it was really sad to watch the first week. We went from you know big audience. We went down to uh, six weeks of less than three percent of our average audience. So um, so so we basically were closed. Um, and you know, I talked to some smart people who run other businesses our size, and most people were going the route of furloughing everybody and just batting down the hatches and wait. And we, we just, we didn't do that. You know, we still had an active pipeline. Um, our advertisers stayed with us for the most part. Obviously they weren't with us when the screens are turned off, but if they had a fourth quarter schedule, almost none of those things canceled. So that gave us, you know, that gave us real courage to say, you know what, let's hold on to as many people as we can. Let's make the team as strong as we can. It's gonna be weird, but uh, let's sell out into the future. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's use this time to be really smart. Let's, let's do some training. Let's, uh, look at this data. So every week we're getting the data that says, yep, you've got no audience next week, <laughs> you've got no audience. And, you know, they were not exciting reports to get every Tuesday, but then as malls started to open up, um, you know, by early June, we had half of them open. And again, whether you think that was the right decision or not, they were pretty safe about social distancing and, and how they were going to treat the customers. There were no door handles in a lot of them. You can walk around, you can stay away from people and people started coming back. So, uh, so now we were able to show a hockey stick where you know, we're plodding along at 2%, then it's 20%, then it's 30, 40, 50. And now we've got about three quarters of our audience back. And that might be the new normal. Maybe it's fewer people in these locations, but that's still a big media company. You know, we're, still, we're still, even now, we're six times bigger than the number one show on broadcast television right now. So. If we can't sell that, then there's something wrong with us. So, so we're back and, uh, you know, it feels good. We're selling stuff. We're pitching. I think, um, you know, advertisers are still being cautious. You know, there's a lot of, it's a very tough time to figure out what your messaging should be. You've got a lot of things going on in the country. So not everybody wants to hear from a burrito company or a car company right now, but, uh, but they're coming back. We're helping them with the creative. Uh, I think we've got a really good, um, environment for that because we're not going to be in the middle of um, a political conversation or you know a conversation that, that might be something you don't want your kids to see uh, we're going to be we're out in the world our screens are ads only the, we do the content there's no, so there's no editorial it's just we're designed to get, get attention and, and and just sort of get get your uh, message out there for brands so I think it's a pretty good place as people recover and they're not sure what their message should be we're a place where it can be a, a simple message. You can go back to, you know, uh, talking to your customers. And, you know, that's part, of, that's part of the recovery as well. Right. And talking about how advertisers use your platform, you're able to do some really cool stuff, some interactive things, especially for families. Is all of that done in-house or do brands typically come to you with the, these great executions? How does that work? It depends. It's funny. So... We have our creative team. We've got an awesome, you know, she's essentially our CMO, but she oversees our creative team and research. Her, her name's Hey Wan Yu, and she's got a long career. And, uh, you know, she's worked at creative agencies and media agencies and publishing. And um, she's just a big idea person. So uh, she, she came here and I hired her and her, her whole thing was, man, this is an incredible canvas. And 
we can do anything for ourselves or for the advertisers, whatever their KPIs are, we can do something fun that can drive results for them. So it's kind of a dream come true for creative people. We have a, a small group uh, run by Johnny Hamilton called Lightbox Studios. And uh, I shouldn't say this publicly, but they are way better than they think they are. Like they are awesome. Like really, it's a world-class creative team. And, you know, I've tried to have these teams at other companies and, you know, they're only as good as, as their talent, right? If, if you're going to see a blue chip advertiser that has, you know, a creative agency roster like Ogilvy or FCB, and you are, you're telling them you've got this great creative team, it better be good. And, and they're that good. Um, they did all of our rebranding uh, in-house, the fonts, the color schemes, the sizzle reels, all that stuff was done in-house. We want to make it easy. Um, you know, at a home is still, I think, too small. It's less than six or 7% of, of us ad spend digital at a home smaller than that. And, uh, the more obstacles we put up, the harder it is to grow that. So if we're going to go see a blue chip advertiser, it better be really good because they may say, you know what, we don't have anything formatted for seven foot screens. We'll take care of it for you, but we've got to live up to their standards if we're going to do that. So yeah, it's been, it's a fun part of the job. Yeah. And, 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 and it sounds like a, right, a, a haven for the creative mind because it is such a fun format. Greg, a lot of the things that you've talked about already, and, and I want to hone in on it, they sound culture driven, right? The decision to, to keep everyone on the team, pivot into training and how do, we, how do we plan for Q3 and Q4, the creative team in house, how important is culture at Lightbox? It's very important. It's, um, you know, I was lucky early in my career. It's funny, I had this really weird job where, um, you know, Clear Channel, going way back and I'll, I'll spare you spare you all the details but right when I started uh, Bill Clinton signed the deregulation act so these media companies could buy a bunch of other companies so all of a sudden there was a feeding frenzy and it was you know so and so owned 18 radio stations and they bought this company that owned 12 and then together they bought this other one and this happened for like the first five years of my career so I wound up in this job where you know we'd buy a group of radio stations and I'd fly in and you you'd sort of spend a week there and right away i swear every time you could just get a sense there's something in the air right that you know i and without naming names or locations but i, I went into one group of radio stations and the wallpaper's peeling people are kind of scowling faces uh i heard you know i heard a hallway argument nobody came to get me in the lobby and that stuff adds up i guarantee you i was like i know i bet you their numbers are bad and sure enough performance was bad hmm. fast forward you go to another market and you know, it's bright, it feels fun, people seem like they wanna be there, everyone's, 19 people are asking me if I need help, and sure enough, their numbers are good. And it just sort of soaked into me that, that culture kind of fixes a lot of things. I've worked for four or five CEOs, and the best ones, I mean, everybody wants to make money, everybody wants profit, but if you just focus on that at, at the expense of everything else, it's really hard to achieve. And if you focus on a great place to work, you wind up with great people and then the profit comes. So I think I was lucky that I worked for good people early on that thought that way. Um, you know, I had bosses that always, if they say they were gonna do something for me, they would say, hey, take this year and if you do X, Y, and Z, we'll do, we'll do this for you. And they always did it. They did what they said they were gonna do. So that became really important to me, you know, and, and uh, a shout out to some bad bosses too. If you have a couple of bad bosses, that helps too, because you know, it's like, I'm not gonna be like that. I'm not gonna do that. I want this to be a great place to work. Um, you know, I want people to get up in the morning and wanna come here, or in this case, wanna log in and, and, not, <laughs> and not go somewhere. But uh, um, yeah, so, so that's it. I mean, look, I think, uh, especially before the pandemic and unemployment was so low, kids are coming out of college with their pick of jobs and uh, you know, you have to make it. You know, I want them to come in. I want you to interview in person so you can see everybody. We're not hiding anything. When you get here, these are the people. Um, it's going to be the nicest group of people you work with. They're high performers. And, uh, you know, I'll take, um, I'll take somebody that maybe gets A minus results, but makes everyone around them better over somebody that gets A plus results, but drags down 12 people. Because the net net is, that doesn't work, right? Now, ideally, you have both, right? It's an A plus, and they also make everyone better. But that's, you know, we'll, we'll get there. I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't even put myself in that group. So, um, so yeah, that's really, really, really important to us. What kind of advice would you give to, right? So a lot of our, our the core audience to the show, business development, account executive types, what advice would you give to a seller in this environment to maybe get, get traction coming out of this? Do you have one hot take that you say, this is kind of the key 
for yeah. making 2020 a, a really successful year? Yeah, it's funny. The last couple of jobs I've had, I've been, you know, I always, I think I'm a seller at heart, whether I'm a CRO or a CEO or a board member, whatever it is. I just, I like making the deals. I think that's really important. My father-in-law always says that, you know, nothing happens until somebody sells something, right, in any business. So, so I think that's really the, the key part of it. But I can't believe how bad some of the pitches I get, you know, the cold, you know, the LinkedIn pitches where somebody's got a service I might or might not need and my name is wrong or the company's name is wrong. It's still ad space. And it's like, man, We've been Lightbox since April of last year. <laughs> you know, it's like, why would I trust you with my business? And then I think there's always six degrees of separation. If you can find some other personal hook, again, don't be phony. But I sent a note to somebody today, uh, a head of media uh, at, at a brand that I haven't talked to this guy in 15 years. I'm not sure he's going to remember me, but I just put it out there and I said, hey, like, if you remember, here's how I think it was when we worked together. And it's just like a little bit of a connection. Find somebody in your team that might know that person. Uh, instead of sending 100 cold emails, I think if you can find a way to reach out to 12 people, I'm going to do it this afternoon. If I can find a way to reach out to 12 people with something a little warmer, I think you're going to have a higher percentage, uh, depending on what you're selling, right? If it's, you know, if it's widgets, then go for it. Send 100 emails with the picture of the widget. But uh, if you need relationships, I mean, our business thinks that it's really a meritocracy now. I mean, advertising, and it's not, right? There's still relationships to it, right? Um, you've got to earn it. Like, I think our screens work. That's why I'm always offering to pay for research because I believe that our screens work. I, if, my, if my sister had a business, I would take her money on our screens because I think I would drive her you know, KPIs for her business. Um, I haven't always felt that way. It's tough to sell something you don't believe in, but I would just say, you know, lean into what you believe in and find a hook and be warm and be personal and, you know, try, I think a dozen reach outs that, that make sense over a hundred that are just a, a shotgun approach. That's how I've always done it. I've never been, I've never been a good, completely cold form letter salesperson and maybe because it, it doesn't work. Yeah. I think that's a valuable takeaway because you hear it all the time, right? Sales is a numbers game. It's a numbers game. It doesn't have to be when you, yeah. when you make those numbers work in your favor. Yeah. Make 12 of the right and just one last, one last piece on that. that, that and I know it, you wish relationships don't matter. And it, there's different types of relationships, right? There's, there's relationships where it's like, hey, I just want to get the door open so I can have this conversation. All I'm asking you for is for the 30 minutes. I don't need you to do me a favor. I don't need you to give me a million dollar IO that I don't deserve. Like that's not what really, relationships are just, hey, somebody, can you make an introduction? I've done great work for you. And you've got a colleague at the agency that has a different brand. Would you be open to just, would you mind just saying, hey, I'm a, I, this worked for your brand and, you know, and those kind of things. So I, I think those are the things when you've earned it and that's the kind of favor to ask for as opposed to just like, hey, can you buy me for fourth quarter because I'm behind my quota, uh, which people, you know, I still, I still get those. So. Sure. I, so it's kind of the one-two punch <laughs> and I really like it in that delivery of, you know what, I'm going to. I'm going to do less of this sort of salesy traditional reach out. I'm going to be more concise with who I'm talking to and then getting over the fear of just, just asking, yeah. right? Hey, can, would, would you mind? Would you mind? Sometimes we're just so afraid to do that. Oh, I don't want to upset the relationship. You know, this is my, per I don't want to do that. So I'll bother a hundred other strangers that I don't know that I could potentially create a relationship with. Yeah. And I'm sure you get them. And it's like, you have to be genuine, right? Like, there, there's some where, you know, you get to the third paragraph and you're like, how do I know this person? And you realize you don't, but like they've, they tried so hard to, you know, they're, they know about my hobbies and this, and they're talking about my alma mater and they're, and it's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And it's a cold call, but they did so much, you know, so you really have to, you have to balance it and be genuine as well. Sure. So if your sister did come to you with her ad budget and her company, how do you measure, like, how, how do you measure performance? For yeah. advertisers. So it's, it's funny. One of the things, you know, I've been in a bunch of businesses where technology was supposed to help the ad business and it disrupted it or destroyed it. Right. And I think that's, what's unique about out of home that people don't talk about enough. If you look at technology, right. Uh, the IAB new fronts today, right. They're talking about how broadcast TV is just getting completely murdered by connected TV. And um, obviously TikTok and digital video is, they're flat. Connected TV is up even through the pandemic and digital video is flat. Desktop's down a little bit. Um, so, so I think the idea that you have something that works, right? Like let's, let's back up, let's take a step back and say, okay, 
out of home generally always works, but it's the hardest thing to measure, right? It's the oldest medium. It's putting signs up on the side of a building, putting signs on your saloon. Like people have been doing out of home for hundreds of years. You know, you measure it. Do you sell more beer in the saloon? Do people, you know, are there more horses outside? You know, all those kind of things. <laughs> for us, we've got now all the technology that's coming in is not disintermediating us. This, this is making our screens more valuable. Um, we've worked with a couple of brands last year where I started getting much more confident where I would, I'll carve out a big chunk of their budget and I'll pay for the research because I believe it's going to work. And if I can say to you, let's say um, I go to one of our beautiful locations like the Sono collection here up, up in uh, Connecticut in Fairfield County. And I've got my device ID, I'm walking around and I see a Verizon ad, one of our big advertisers or Facebook Oculus. And I'm exposed to that on our screens. I'm in the mall for 45 minutes. I'm exposed to that ad. And then anonymously, they know that then I go back and four days later, I bought an Oculus. Well, we finally can get the attribution for that. We know that this was a, a Greg Glenday's device was exposed to that screen and I became a customer. We've done things like this with Chipotle and Lego. And we know we can sell Lego sets. We can sell specific Lego sets, right? We did we did a really cool control and expose study with these um, specific Harry, Harry Potter Lego sets. And the exposed device IDs, right, they were exposed to the Harry Potter creative, went into the Lego store and they asked for this specific set. And the only way you would know about the Harry Potter set was on our screen. So it's like this infallible research that when it comes back, I get you get giddy to pitch it to the client because you're not... This is not like, hey, your sales grew 1.6% and we think it was our screens that did that and you should give us credit. This is like sales grew 112% and we know that the only place they saw them was on our screens. And it just, it's, it's just such a fun thing to do because the client's happy, the agency's happy, the brand manager's happy. So, I mean, ultimately it really can be a win-win. Sure, I want more money, but I want to earn it. And, uh, you know, the fact that everybody is geofencing, whether it's Foursquare, the place at the time, Intermix, everybody's geofenced our locations because there's so much retail there. So we already know what's going on. We already know that people are there, they're back, what they're exposed to, and then what they go do. If they test drive a BMW and we've been running heavy BMW schedules and those devices were more likely to go into that dealership, wonderful. I mean, that's, it's that simple. Like we shouldn't overcomplicate it. It worked, you know? So um, I, get, I get very excited about the measurement because it's new, whereas programmatic and some of these other things have decimated magazines right think about what it's done to them they try to put it online and let programmatic take over and you just become this sea of impressions right it's not all impressions are created equal and i will i i don't know how we let this happen uh but there are shows that i think certainly as the super bowl aside there are shows where people are going to sit through the commercials and there are shows where they aren't um there are things where you need to watch it live and there are things that aren't and you know, our screens are not interrupting anything. We're not interrupting. People don't go there to watch something on our screens and then they're annoyed at the ads because the ads are interrupting what they came there for. It's just part of the whole experience. So I don't think at a home in general gets enough credit for that, that we are the least intrusive, meaning we're not making you stop what you're doing. Even Shazam, like we were very careful when someone was trying to get the name of a song, we never said, hey, we're going to hold it. We know the answer to your question, but we're gonna hold it hostage till you watch this video. We told you right away, here's the song, and by the way, here's, here's an ad, you know? So I think that's the right way to work with consumers in 2020, and uh, I think obviously broadcast TV is figuring that out too. So anyway, I, I think the question was measurement, but I get really excited and I just keep going, so. No, it's cool, I, 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 because you've opened up a concept that I think is important to talk about. It's not that measurement made out of homework, out of home has always worked. It's just now we can measure it, right? Yes. So then you think back to all of the intrinsic value of legacy advertisers, whether that's a national brand or a local advertiser, of what that investment is and really what that conversation can and should be of, hey, we can, we can tell you what it does now. Also, the last 10 years you've been with us, that's built incredible equity in your brand. And, and I think that measurement allows us to have a really good conversation around the total value of out of home. Yeah. You know, advertising, yeah, you know, we sort of pretend to be this like super data driven now with a scientific, but it's a fairly inefficient thing, right? If you were to be, you know, take a, take the, you know, the smartest data scientist or analyst at uh, MIT or, 
uh, a consulting firm and have somebody who doesn't know anything about this business come in and look at it and say, you can reset the whole business. It would not look like this. Uh, you know, the dollars do not flow to where the attention is. The dollars flow. I, I remember um, selling digital and, like, and you're just like, how did we get to this clicks thing? Like, how did this happen? This is not, this doesn't make any sense. Like we're measuring the wrong thing, but the report card, we're reporting on the wrong stuff. But, um, you know, so I think it's, it's getting there. And I think everybody's, you know, there's a lot of smart people. Um, you know, I'd had a conversation recently, guys like Lou Pascalis at Bank of America, who everybody knows, who's, you know, a super smart, well-read, follows everything. He and John Patel, like they talk about these like the context, right? Like it's not just who's seeing the ad, but where is it and the mood. And it's, there's so many other things to think about. It's not as precise. So you have to be able to use a little bit of gut too. And, um, but like you said, 10 years ago, it's like, you kind of think this billboard's going to work or this screen might work, but if you can't prove it, it's just too risky. Uh, and as they used to always say, no, you know, nobody gets fired for buying the number one show on TV, you know? So <laughs> you're, you're right. And, and that's it. I, it's a great, it's a great segue of, of authority and what, what platforms and formats carry authority because every impression is not created equal. And that's something that out of home uh, has the unique ability to do is really to, to project whatever that is with authority, almost regardless of where, you know, yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. You know, I think about people who are supposed to be competitors of ours, right? I think about like, screen vision and captivate and you know the way digital at home has has grown up for some reason we've gotten in these silos i don't think that's the right way i I'm, i seem to be alone in that but this idea that like we, you know we have these sets of inventory that's not the way people live their lives right no one thinks of themselves as an elevator rider or uh, a mall shopper it's you do all of those things right i ride elevators i pump gas i go to the movies i go to the mall and, you know, so I think when we start thinking about it like audience, instead of vertically, we start thinking horizontally, I think it's going to be better for everybody. And then you really start to earn it, right? Um, we have Captivate in our elevators in, in uh, at, at uh, Lightbox in 99 Park. And I'm always jealous of, you know, I get in, I'm like, man, this is a great place for an ad. I'm staring at it. It's a short ride, but I'm staring at it. And, and then I know they feel like, oh, I wish my screens were bigger like yours and had sound, you know? So the grass is greener, but we're different. We all have different ways of communicating with those consumers. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to start to get as, you know, as programmatic really takes off. And I think we have a chance to do it right and not just make it a sea of impressions and a race to the bottom. I think there'll be context around it and really smart people are thinking about it. So, um, so I'm very hopeful about, you know, how, how technology uh, beyond just location stuff, but the, the, the programmatic people, they're not trying to recreate the digital programmatic animal that's one-to-one -one and at a home. They're trying to create a programmatic model that works for one-to-many, which is what we should be. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. I like the idea that a whole family can see an ad, right? If we've got an ad for HBO Max on our screens, my whole family can see it. You know, it could be a grandparent with a grand, it's that brand fame has been lost with all this super precision, right? Like my kids see a lot of ads I never see and I see a lot of ads they never see. And I'm not sure that that's great for brands and brand health. Like you said, you and I could probably sing the same Coca-Cola songs from growing up and all that stuff. And there's something about that, that that's kind of lost now besides that at home. Right. <laughs> and, and a great opportunity for smaller startup brands to step in and do some of those things and, and potentially scale quickly because of it or some of the blue chips to, uh, to bring it back into the mix as they figure out, you know, what, what is the message in this, in yeah. this unique environment? So I think all great things. Yeah. So Greg, if you're down, uh, my man, Carlos, we're calling this Carlos's questions. <laughs> Carlos Zavala, he's the marketing manager for in motion media out in California. He said, Tim, can you like, can you start asking all the guests a couple of like the same questions? So yeah. if you're down. Love it. Sure. So uh, I'm just going to pick a couple of them here. We'll maybe do two or three. First question, which I think is a lot of fun. If you weren't doing what you are right now, being in the out-of-home space, running Lightbox, what would you be doing? Oh, man. So I, this answer has changed through the quarantine, right? Um, I think I would do something uh, with coaching or, and it could be, it could be anywhere from life coaching to coaching kids to, I just, uh, I've spent so much time with my kids and I've spent a lot of time on self-improvement in the quarantine. You know, if, uh, I'm spending 10 hours a week on the train normally. So 
I said to myself, if I get to the end of this quarantine and I've wasted those 10 hours a week, mm. and I used to be on the train and I just, I'm wasting them. So, you know, I've been doing yoga. I've been doing a lot of meditating. I've been doing a lot of stuff that like I've wanted to get to. I've been reading a ton of books that were collecting dust on the shelf. So, um, so I'm really into, you know, biohacking and, and a bunch of stuff like that. So um, I think I'd be really into that kind of thing. Like what makes people live happier lives? Um, I want to incorporate some of that into the light box life, but certainly it's not the whole thing. So I think something around wellness and, you know, just helping more people uh, live fuller, better, uh, more positive lives, I think would be something. And if you asked me this in February, I would have said something completely different. So this is a post quarantine answer. Well, you know what? I think it's a great long term answer because if nothing else, we've learned through this quarantine and social distancing. It's a mental game. Uh, it is a hundred percent between these six inches of, yeah. uh, of how you perceive and interpret. So true. I think that's great. Let's see. Uh, this is a fun one. We've talked a little bit about it, but maybe just a, a, a chance for you to crystallize on it. What are you currently most excited about? Oh, um, so I would say for Lightbox, I feel like, I, you know, we woke up a couple of weeks ago and things started to open up. I'm most excited about how this is all going to reset stuff. Um, you know, I think what happened not only with COVID um, and, you know, I'm from New York. My, my family's all on Long Island. They were kind of in the, the first epicenter of it in the U.S. and just sort of watching everybody go through that. And, and then into uh, uh, George Floyd and all the stuff that happened there and how awful that was and, and just what's happening with the country. And, um, you know. I'm really excited about what's going to happen after this. You know, I think it's, uh, I think all of this is a catalyst for um, change that's overdue. I think there's stuff that's been going on that just, you, I'm embarrassed to say you don't see it because it's just, you grew up that way. You wouldn't realize that it, you don't know any different. And uh, I think um, it, this is just a really, just, I think all of this coming together, the fact that, you know, if, if people weren't, stuck at home maybe it wouldn't be so easy to go out and march and protest and get the voices out so so i'm excited for um you know selfishly for the malls to open and our screens to come back and for us to do positive things in the community and help our brand partners and find new advertisers um you know i'm excited that uh that revenue is starting to come back so now we can bring things back and start doing all the things we wanted to do uh you know there was a point there where i thought we were going to get to january 1st and i had an idea that we would get everybody to just say Let's start over. Let's start. Let's when we get to January first, we're gonna say it's 2020 again, and we're just gonna do the whole year over. Pretend 2020 didn't happen and just reset the whole thing. I, I don't think we have to do that anymore. So, so I'm pretty excited for sort of uh, a safe reopening and somewhat back to normal, safely seeing family and friends. And um, you know, I, I think it's it, it's time for that, and I, I'm really excited about that. It's great. I think we're excited for a lot of the same things. It's gonna be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you talked about in the answer to question one and, and the behind you, what's your book recommendation for the moment? Oh, so I just finished, and I know this has been out a little while, but uh, is it, it's James Clear, Atomic Habits. Okay. And, um, I read it because I wanted, I had always heard about it and I wanted my 14 year old to read it. And I, I, I was like, I can't be a hypocrite and ask her to read it if I haven't read it yet. Um, I was like, this is not going to be anything new for me. But the whole idea behind little incremental changes was, I wish I actually read it in, you know, before the quarantine, but uh, it really solidified my, my thoughts on, you know, making little changes. Um, you know, I usually go business book, fun book, business book, fun book. Uh, next on the list, um, uh, something, something deeply hidden, John Carroll, that's a quantum physics for dummies book. Cool. Um, Jim Quick, Limitless. Love Jim Quick. Ending Aging, and then Graham Hancock, uh, America Before. So these are my next four. <laughs> great, great recommendations. I'm going to add a few of those. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm reading a book right now. This guy, his name's Jesse Cole. He owns a, uh, not even a professional baseball team. He owns a team called the Savannah Bananas. It's in Savannah, Georgia. And Jesse Cole is well known for wearing this yellow tuxedo. It is summer college baseball. So it's not a high quality product, but he's a student of Walt Disney and Barnum Bailey and his whole approach is creating an experience. They have no advertisers in the stadium. They're sold out every single game. So uh, maybe one for, for your cool. list after you get through those. 
Jesse Cole, got it. Jesse Cole. So good stuff. Greg, this has been a lot of fun. Where can people find more about you, about Lightbox? What's the best places yep. online you, to find you guys? All, all of our info. Um, we've got a lot of great stuff on our website, Lightbox out of home. So lightboxooh.com. Uh, I'm Greg at lightboxooh.com. Uh, on LinkedIn, you know, um, I, 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 that's probably the best place to find us. Either of those things, feel free. And uh, would love to talk to anybody. I've got more time. I'm trying to spend more time with people I don't know, uh, which sounds crazy in this, but you know, um, I'm doing lunch club and things like that, which I never would have done before this. So, so happy to talk. And I love kind of, I love stuff like this. So I think this is really fun and uh, I appreciate you having me on. Very good. And we appreciate you doing it. Thank you. And for anyone listening, if this has been helpful, I encourage you go ahead and click that share button button, send it to somebody who could benefit And as always, if you want to get swagged up, you can check out OOHswag.com. Make sure to use promo code INSIDER, right? We're going to need to start putting a store on there for all the guests because everyone's got great (laughs) swag. So uh, check it out, and we'll talk to you guys real soon. See ya.